So tell us, when did you get this one, Lester? About 20 years ago. I bought it in ago. auction. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was already involved with Robert Paul and I liked his stuff, but yeah. it was very, very rare to find. I'd found a carbon arc uh, lamp, which I'd bought with his name on it. And then this came up at auction. Yeah, and nice uh, projector mechanism, which has the details on it. And it's a very rare century. So obviously from, as it says on the patent listing, 1899, 1900. It starts the patent listing with 1896 because it's a century animatograph. And the first theatrograph or animatograph patents were around that time. But obviously this has changed somewhat in terms of the mechanism. Um, not in concept, but in design detail. And what's very special about this, Lester? It has only got three cutouts on the star mechanism. Yeah, what we might call a star mechanism, even though it doesn't have the... It's got three slots, but not the usual crescents. Um, we'll go in more detail in that with some close-ups in a minute. Um, essentially, the reason for three is that the acceleration rate's increased. or the uh, pull down rate. Mm -hmm. So there's less of a blanking period on the screen. So you see the picture, each picture for longer on the screen and the pull down period is reduced. Hence, the shutter is very small, almost like a knife blade, small section of that uh, 360 degree circle of the shutter. You have to have some subtlety in operating this machine because it's quite difficult to start the mechanism in motion. Once it's going, it's okay, but there's a very high resistance. Yeah, when you get, it sort of locks. But we have just determined that it will happily project a film. The biggest problem in terms of doing that is that, as you'll see, there are sprocket pads, guards, sprocket rollers to hold the film onto the sprocket and the top one is missing you see the holes here where it would have been and what that means is obviously the reason for that top sprocket which was an addition from you know which they designed about 1895-6 was that uh, otherwise the film goes directly into the gate and you're putting a lot of pressure on on the film as it comes down with the weight of the film on the spool so this is where the latham loop would have been that takes that pressure away and then the film comes off the spool. Uh, we could still use this as a projector as we just um, tried by putting the film, having the film going directly in the gate and missing the top sprocket and it projects very happily. Yeah, so um, quite a nice solid gate there and uh, possibly a replacement spring or just a cleaned up spring, we're not sure, but that still works well. And what's really, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the lens goes up and down on the little thumb screw, so you can frame the picture reasonably. Of course, if it's completely out of frame in the gate, you won't be able to do much but relace it, but it gives you some latitude. And um, if we look at the uh, sprocket, it's tiny because three arms and four perforations of frame. Three times four is 12. So there are only 12 teeth on the sprocket. And the smallest sprockets that are normally in use are for four arm sprockets, four fours are 16. So they're 16 teeth. So that's the smallest 35 mil intermittent sprocket you'll ever see, because it's not possible to have less than, fewer than three arms on the, on the um, intermittent. So, uh, you almost well possibly unique size of intermittent sprocket so very interesting for lots of reasons and you know kind of indicates not all of the ideas are new that these people incorporated but i think robert paul clearly either he's you know he's got a good mechanic somewhere who's giving him advice or he's inventing these things we're not sure which but the idea of the three cross three arm cross or three slot cross, because it doesn't have arms as such, um, was ingenious. I think it might be the reason why 
some operators said, oh, we don't like roll call machines, they chew the film up and, you know, we got, they jam up and stuff, is because they didn't quite have the finesse. And Leicester has the finesse to make it work properly. Backwards, forwards, backwards and forwards. And you'll notice that this operator uh, has fixed the handle on the other side to usual. Um, not quite sure why that was. Might be because he was left-handed, as you say, or well, there might be other reasons, but um, uh, it's, it's jammed on there and probably a bit dangerous to try to remove it. There is a thread on the other side for the handle to go onto, but it, you know, it works fine like that. And you could actually get that going because it only needs a simple arm that will feed the film straight into the gate. And as long as you use short films, that won't be a problem of not using that sprocket. And then the film comes off and it doesn't really need an arm, it can go straight into a basket. So you could happily show a short film on that using modern light source. Um, after, so effectively, you know, despite the fact there are bits missing, um, 117 years after it was made, um, it's still a functional machine, uh, which is what one of the things that fascinates us about these particular mechanisms is that there aren't equivalent mechanisms today or machines today. You know, your iPhone is not going to be working in 115 years' time. There's a sprung arm here, yeah, that just falls into into that slot. Just goes into the slot there just a little bit to actually stop it. That's the equivalent of a cutout on a normal star cross. So it's it's a slightly different arrangement. Um, perfectly valid. It works okay. The usual gear arrangement. Very lightweight gear, it's quite a lightweight machine more for transporting than, than for a permanent installation, which of course in 1899, in, well 1900 or shortly afterwards, that's mostly what you would have had. Um, uh, Travelling showmen, temporary shows. Uh, Mentioned this is totally scrap film, so we don't have to worry about that. Do you want to do all that again? Um, you happy with that? I'm happy with that, I think. 